name is David Hall, CEO of TAM. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I wanted to share a little bit about why we started this webinar series. And it is about collaboration. Uh, we wanted doctors sharing their real life experiences and real world applications with other doctors around the world. And that's why we started this series. Uh, last month began with the surgical hybrid world, uh, how we uh, might find a fit relevant to our strategy as doctors, in this case, surgeons. And today we're going to share uh, about the metaverse, uh, surgeons in the metaverse, and how we might navigate uh, this virtual world that is still taking shape. I'd like to uh, introduce our dear friend. He's a, uh, a friend of healthcare, friend of innovation, a friend of digital health, Mr. Gil Bash. He's global chair, health and purpose, Finn Partners, a top 10 digital health influencer, correspondent, health, uh, health tech world, editor in chief, Medica. And I will give it over to Gil. Thank you, Gil. David, David, that very kind. Thank you for that great introduction. And thank you to TAMP for hosting this conversation. I, I, this is a very important conversation. I think we all know the effects of the pandemic and how it accelerated the use of technologies. Uh, some people think that digital health is a fad. It is not. In fact, it's getting much more serious. Um, I'll be issuing on Monday a uh, part of a team that's issuing a comprehensive study that looked at uh, over 200 million data points um, regarding global digital health. And I can say that though the total number has uh, of investment has dropped to about 22 billion in 2022, in fact, that number is far greater than investment in this category prior to COVID. So what we're seeing not is a de decreased interest in digital health, just a strategic correction of taking a look at where smart money is going. We have four amazing, amazing speakers today. Uh, at the end of the conversation, we'll get into a group Q&A, and I want to thank them for that. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Raphael Grossman, who's agreed to be in conversation with me during his session. Uh, many of you know Dr. Grossman. If you if you haven't seen his face before, I I've never seen his eyes before. All I always see is his face. If you go online, you just see you just see this part of Dr. Grossman. Today, we'll actually have a chance to see full face Dr. Grossman, which is a real treat for me. Um, I, I just want to say that in the context of virtual reality and the metaverse, we're going to hear from our speakers a bit about um, AI augmented reality, blockchain, how they're using virtual reality and surgery, and, and actually how all of these technologies are converging around patient care. Um, I, I would say that digital health is uh, intimidating. These technologies are intimidating. The, the first stage of really taking a look is, is understanding, awareness, and, and then feeling a sense of confidence, confidence where you can be, continue to be curious. So we really invite your curiosity today. And with that, I, we have a tight schedule. I want to kick off immediately. We have a, a noted, noted plastic surgeon who's going to kick off, Dr. Leonardo D'Souza. Aguiar, I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Aguiar. Would you kick off and talk a little bit about what you're doing in the world of virtual reality and uh, in plastic surgery and, and how you're using the best of digital health technologies to perfect your craft and care for your patients? Over to you. Thank you, Gil. Hello, everybody. Um, please, next slide, Fium. Right now, uh, before we start talking about the metaverse, I would like to introduce some concepts about digital care cycle. And as Gil said before, we are so, uh, we don't know exactly the real impact of this fourth industrial revolution in our lives, in our daily practice, in our patient. We are still understanding what's happening on a daily basis. Please, next slide, Fiona. 
And sometimes I have some colleagues and, and me as example, we have what we call this disruptive stress because we have so many information, so many new technologies, and we don't have uh, time to absorb all these new technologies to deliver value, to give a better care to our patients. That's why we are, next slide, that's why we are talking about digital health innovation. That's why we are talking about digital health literacy. That's why we are doing what we are doing right now to understand the impact all of all these new technologies, making this digital transformation, next life, on these specific points, digital patients, journey, digital care, and digital therapy. Next slide, please. That's because we have to understand the digital patients are uh, producing data on a 24 per seven daily basis and everything that can be measured can be improved. And we as a doctor, as a doctor that understands this new digital world, we must change our mindset to analytic, preventive and predict predictive mindset. Next slide, please. And using this mindset on the patient journey and every step of this journey, every step of this digital journey can be uh, created an app, can be created a technological solution to improve the quality of this specific point or uh, on every step of the journey. Next slide, please. Next. Next. And I think next, I think this is the digital opportunity because we have more than 5 million downloads of app a day or health apps a day, but only 20% of these apps meet the, the standards. Next slide. And how do we know that they are safe and effective? So right now we are leaving this new contest. We are having wearables and softwares as a medical device. Next slide. And right now we are having this new, this new digital care cycle that's safe and effective. With all this new journey, having this scientific validation. Next slide, please. So we are next. So we are starting from administrative and, uh, and all this digitization of this general aspects, moving to virtual care delivery. Next slide. And we are right now on the cutting edge. We are starting to understand how this new digital care cycle with scientific evidence based are moving safe and effectively to metaverse because we are just starting to navigate this new, next slide. Yes, it's okay. Next, please. And we are starting to navigate the healthcare in metaverse. Next slide. And that's the 10 steps that we are preparing right now, how to work in digital health in this new digital care cycle inside the metaverse. That's the point, how we can navigate. So uh, thank you so much and let's move on. Boy, I'll tell you, Leonardo, that was great. Uh, you were you were moving so fast. I was trying to go click, click, click in my mind with your slides and I'm, I'm looking forward to the Q&A because I've got a, a ton of questions for you. So, you know, uh, get your water close at hand and get ready because I think you have a lot to share. You, you provided us with a broad overview of the category. I want to leap over now to conversation with Dr. Grossman. And uh, Raphael, you, you, you really were one of the early in um, um, innovators in terms of the conversation around digital health and virtual reality. And I, I have an unusual question for you. I hope, I hope you don't mind. You know, you, you were kind of there and immersed in this category well before COVID hit. Now, this is not, COVID was not the catalyst for you at all. You, you saw something in this years ago. So I, I wanted to start off and ask you a little bit, why? Why did you feel you wanted to lean into this? You know, uh, surgery is a busy profession. Obviously, robotics and other technologies play a role here. But you you kind of went two or three steps ahead of the category of, of, um, of your colleagues. What was the inspiration? Thanks, Jill. It's uh, <clears throat> great to be here and really uh, thank you to you and David and, and especially my, my co-hosts, uh, my, my 
uh, co-speakers uh, for allowing me to be here. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a full-time surgeon. I'm a clinician. That's what I love to do with, with passion. I've done this for, for more than a couple of decades. I'm from Venezuela originally. And uh, I've always been a little bit of a geek, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from when I was a kid, reading Jules Verne books, you know, talking about the moon and, and uh, the, the oil revolution and, and uh, the things that did not even exist. And I've always had my eyes sort of uh, on a little bit of fantasy, I think. Uh, I did uh, one of my internships uh, was in a rural area in the Amazon in Venezuela. And I, I kind of felt the... The, the difficulty of, 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 of communicating and connecting uh, when you try to, to do medicine. And uh, that was the, the, uh, the topic of, of one of my TEDx talks that I did in Bermuda. And um, when I became a sort of a full fresh physician, uh, I more and more realized the, the, the importance of communicating and connecting. And uh, most of the errors in healthcare are because of the lack of or poor connection and connectivity. And uh, so we started doing telemedicine when I first came to Maine uh, back almost uh, 19 years ago. And uh, it, it was so difficult to do telemedicine, big towers, low speed, you know, low bandwidth. Uh, so we still did it back then because we didn't have any other options, you know, because of the distances, because of the weather in Maine, same thing in Venezuela. Uh, and uh, when the iPhone 4 came out in 2010 with uh, FaceTime, and uh, we could finally uh, not just uh, think about connecting with a cellular, you know. Uh, I always show this guy, you know, remember this? And we have gone from this to this, right, in, in just a few decades, right? And uh, a, a supercomputer in our pockets, when this supercomputer allow us to do video connectivity, uh, I thought th this is going to be amazing. This is going to be a, a, a revolution of sorts. And it, it never was. Uh, we started uh, thinking about, you know, privacy and cost and regulation uh, with reason, but those obstacles prevented this from really evolving to uh, when the time of COVID uh, hit. And then everyone said, hey, why don't we connect with video and we'll, why don't we do telehealth and telemedicine? So I, I've always kind of thought that we have the technology, but it's not about the technology, it's about the smart use of the technology in order to improve how we do care. And that is very, very important. Uh, I'll, I'll finish the, the answer with saying I've always you always heard about the, the three or four, four pillars of, of healthcare, right? Uh, we talk about cost, we talk about outcomes, and we talk about a patient experience. And now lately, thank God, we talk about providers' experience. Those are the four pillars. I would add two more. I would say that we have six pillars in medicine, and the the fifth pillar is uh, a technology, the smart use of technology, and obviously the fourth pillar that is probably the first. Uh, is about humanity. I think that those six pillars is what medicine should be. And I don't talk about telehealth or digital health. I talk about health because it's the same healthcare, it's the same medicine, except that now we have the tools that we didn't have or we had but did not use, you know, decades ago. You know, you 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 really talked about a a, a long term behavior pattern um, that you were you were creative you had imagination uh you were a dot collector uh connector of sorts you know not, not everybody is wired that way uh you are but not everybody is so my, my question for you is uh because you're in a, you're in a health system you know you, you you've you've been a a leading surgeon in major medical centers in the northeast what would be your prescription for people listening in today, not listening in, we'll see this video later on. How do they start to explore the world of the metaverse, virtual reality, augmented intelligence? Uh, how do they begin to dabble and learn and develop some confidence and competency to begin to sort of bring it in? And I know as a surgeon, you know, certainly robotics, you know, way back when in the basement Da Vinci, I would watch surgeons go to the basement and practice a, a, a soon to be performed difficult surgery. So technology is not new to surgery, but the metaverse seems to be a whole different conversation. Where do we begin? How do we learn? Well, you know, we, we begin like this. This is how we begin. It's about education. It's about the change of culture. It's about telling people about what's out there and how can we use that in order to improve 
how we care for patients, how we educate the next generations, how we improve, how we connect and we communicate. It, it, it takes a, a lot. It takes a lot of, of, of uh, advocacy and uh, uh, become a, a, an evangelist of sorts, you know, uh, giving talks. When I gave my first TEDx talk, I thought, well, this is a powerful tool, powerful tool to change people's minds in, in, in whatever topic is about a, a, a Ideas worth sharing, which is the the, the motto of, of TED. Uh, we, we have to actively push the the limits of uh, the regulators, of uh, the administrators, of the colleagues, of the patients. Every stakeholder needs to realize that technology is out there to help us. And uh, uh, this is a great uh, uh, example of how can we uh, spread the word. Uh, you know, I remember when when I did the first operation with. With Google Glass, when I when I, I went, I was in exponential medicine before it was called exponential medicine. It was called Future Med with Daniel Kraft, a good friend of, of ours, and and uh, I saw Babak Parvis, the inventor of Google Glass. When I saw this device back in 2012, immediately I I, I cornered the guy. So I needed to get this in order to use it in surgery. And then I did the first surgery with Google Glass. And all I did was stream the surgery to a group of students uh, next door, rather than them being behind me trying to see what I was doing. And that caused a lot of a, 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 a excitement, I guess. My good friend, uh, both common friend, uh, John Nosta, uh, wrote an article in Forbes, and and it went viral, and that sort of catapulted my, I guess, my my, my myself to 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 a level of of being a communicator and a disruptor, a a a, a, a they call it a, a someone who's a, a has a, a, a healthy disrespect for authority. So I almost <laughs> was was fired because I used this device, although I got oh my everyone in my team. And, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't call you a disruptor. I would call you a. Uh, you're certainly courageous. You're <laughs> you're a, you're a pioneer. And you know, I would say to everybody who's listening in today, we've quite a few people who are participating today, and we'll see this in the future. Uh, follow all of our panelists. Follow Dr. Grossman. You, I'm sure all of them are on LinkedIn. I'm sure that they would welcome this community's following you and others on LinkedIn. Uh, Dr. Grossman, Raphael, you're also on Twitter. You're very active on Twitter. And, um, and um, yeah. you know, we, we have many, many common friends, Daniel being one of them, um, and uh, John being a very close friend of both of ours. Uh, so I, I wanted to sort of ask you now to pivot off that question, like almost being fired, um, because you're kind of shaking the system. You, you're, you're not frightened to shake the system, but yet you're you're a leader in the system. So for people who are thinking of doing something new in their system, based on what you've learned, you know, let, no one wants to step on a landmine intentionally. Would you mind disclosing your counsel to our listeners? What would you say to say, look, um, don't do this if you want to be ahead of the curve. Here's a safer route to go to incorporate technology of the metaverse into your clinical practice without pissing off your chair? <laughs> well, uh, some people wouldn't agree that I'm the best person to, to do that because I get... <laughs> well, you've I been in the I'm fire sure. before, so you actually... Absolutely. Someone who plays it too safe is, is not going to help us. Someone who pushes the envelope, who knows what it is to get singed and, and sort of readjust, you're the best teacher here. And that's what Tam tends to bring forward all of our panelists, you are the best teachers of the discipline. So give us your secret. Now, I, I think that it's about the communicating well and, uh, and realizing that first that the, the tools that you have are the best tool or the better tools in order to take care of patients and then talk to the patients, you know, make sure they have a frank conversation so they understand, talk to your team, talk to your team leaders, to your administrators. And, and sometimes you have, you know, I wouldn't say that it's a, a, a recommended to, to ask for forgiveness rather than permission, but sometimes you have to, because once you're convinced that the tools are there, you know, for years and years and years in the past system where I was in Maine, uh, Northern Light Health System, I tried to convince them to do telehealth, to do telemedicine. You know, I had tools, uh, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality tools to educate the nurses, to educate, and they were always, you know, afraid, oh, this is about pride. So they were really, and I kept pushing, pushing until I really had to leave the system because I was completely convinced you know, we started with Google Glass and then, you know, we came, you know, to, to the point where this is the, the, the new magic leap, the magic leap to, you know, this is a device that has been in the, in the boiler, you know, for a little while. This is the second version. This tool, 
the Meta Pro, which is a quick evolution of the of the Oculus that was only a few years ago, wow. you know, barely being accepted. And and these devices, right, are there, and uh, we need to become convinced that there are platforms out there for education, you know, fundamental surgery, fundamental VR, for example, Apocular, a, a, a Medivis, a, a Animaris, the Inside Heart series, a, you know, platforms that are there that are proven right to help educate better and even diagnose better and possibly, and, and it's being proved, treat better. You have platforms that are being used, not just education and diagnostics, but also a treatment. You have Magic Leap's uh, a agreement with the Level X and the Brain, a, a brain Lab, which is a, a surgical navigation platform, which is evolving the, the monitors to spatial computing using a device like, like Magic Leap, for example, or the HoloLens. Uh, you know, this is the, the Blade 2, which is basically a regular set of glasses, but it's an augmented reality set of glasses. So why would you use a flat 2D computer when you can use spatial computing and have a much better human factor a, a, a design, a more ergonomic interaction with the digital world, with the EMR that a, you need in order to treat your patients. So I think that you, one needs to become informed and convinced that this is the way to go. You have places like Cedar sinai in LA that are treating patients in the hospital with narcotics and with VR for pain control, for anxiety, for depression. There's no PTSD. doubt. PTSD VR. Thousands of, pap of papers that validate the technology. So once you're convinced, you need to bring it up to the right stakeholders in your hospital and your, your system. And if they're not convinced, well, maybe it's not the right place for you. I really think that one needs to keep evolving and not be, you know, a, a, in, a, in, a, in a place where you can really a, a practice the medicine of the 21st century what, a, that, that we ought to practice. So, so I'm going to ask you in the few moments we have less in this part of the session um you're you're a futurist who's rooted in today in other words right from this call you might be going into surgery and and so you're not going to use things that are sort of at the, sort of like way ahead of the curve you're going to use things that that you have demonstrated to your team are going to improve their performance during surgery but could you give us some indication of what we need to be ready for to learn about, because you said something that was very important. These, this sort of call, this webinar is a basis for developing the competency we need in clinical medicine to do our best for patients. So what, what's gonna happen next week? Can you, can you share with us a little insight with what's in your, in, in your office? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm an advisor for, for a few companies, as you know, most of them are unpaid advisorships or consultancies, but uh, one of the companies that, that I engaged with a few uh, years ago, I think, thanks to our friend John Nosta, by the way, uh, is Nanox Vision, which is a company that's trying to revolutionize how we uh, uh, basically, uh, how we uh, do imaging. We know about CAT scans, right? Everyone gets a CAT scan when you enter the ED pretty much, at least in the US. And, and it's unfortunate that that's the case because it's expensive and it's bulky and it's big and it's isolated to areas that can really a, 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 a afford CAT scans, right? But the Nanox a, a, a vision, a vision is to democratize that and uh, create now a, a tomogram, a, 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 imagine not a CT, but a tomogram, which we used to do before we had CT, a tomogram that is uh, affordable, that is portable, that is enabled by cloud-based artificial intelligence to give you a better diagnosis and to democratize, to spread that all around the world when instead of having a machine that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can have a device that costs maybe tens of thousands of dollars and that is it, it, tied to a global augmented intelligence a diagnostic a algorithm. And that a, doesn't have a lot of radiation that is portable. A, imagine the power of a tool like that. It's not a, 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 a CT, a computer tomograph. Well, you're setting me up for the question I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you at the end. So I'm going to tell you the question so you can think about it as we move on to Dr. Jones. But, Absolutely. but you know, medicine, medicine is a culture. And you're kind of um, you talked about being disruptive. I won't say that. You're counterculture. You're, you're prepared to sort of like, like push against the culture. You know, medicine is also about economics. And whenever you talk about, um, whenever you talk about change, you talk about sort of shifting how money is made in the medical system. So I'm definitely going to be asking you a question of how 
health innovators navigate the very fragmented health ecosystem economically because you know you 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 are expansive so i'm asking you the question now don't answer it save it to the end we're going to move on rafael it's always awesome to be with you and you. Uh, i think you're going to see john nost in israel next week so um so send him my love please now it's my you. pleasure it's oh, oh it's my pleasure to introduce to everybody dr sean curtis jones and Dr. Jones is, as I mentioned earlier, he's an otolaryngologist, he's a noted speaker, he's a consultant. He also is a, uh, a leading physician at one of the nations in the United States, one of this nation's largest health systems, which is called Baptist Health. Baptist Health actually is a cutting edge system. It's uh, about 140 locations, uh, centers, and they have a department of health innovation technology that travels the world looking for the best in innovation. Dr. Curtis is obviously one of the recipients of that. And so Dr. Curtis, it's my pleasure to invite you to the, the virtual stage to share some insights. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing and learning from you. Thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. That's very kind. And um, I just want to say that um, I'm very pleased uh, and happy to be here and, and humbled, honestly, to be with such a uh, uh, a number of other physicians who've been so instrumental in, in pushing the envelope in this area. From my perspective, I sort of backed into this in a way, uh, my uh, specialty being otolaryngology, technology has always kind of been a, a part of the otolaryngologist universe. And so as uh, the Da Vinci robot became uh, implemented, and uh, I trained uh, with Drs. O'Malley and and others at uh, the U University of Pennsylvania, and then um, began to use Biomet's 3D renderings or for custom facial plating and facial reconstruction, uh, endoscopic views uh, when it came to image guidance and skull-based surgery and rhinology. Uh, and then the Inspire implant a little more recently or hypoglossal nerve play, uh, pacing for obstructive sleep apnea. All of these were heavy technology areas. And uh, as, as Dr. Grossman indicated, I think very adeptly, a lot of these uh, technologies really are about communicating in a sense, communicating with the patient, communicating uh, information from the patient's perspective, whether it be an image or uh, a, a waveform or something else uh, to the physician or back to the patient. In a way, it it sort of got one thinking about what the implications were of being able to connect these in some sort of meaningful way, not just for the sake of connection, but actually for the sake of improving the quality uh, of care, as Dr. Grossman said. I think that's the end uh, goal, and I think it's important to always recognize that's what the end is, is to improve quality. And uh, uh, as David in indicated at the beginning of the, uh, the webinar, democratization, because if these technologies are available and aren't widely applicable or um, able to be disseminated to places where they need to be, then it, it's not going to be as effective as we'd want them to be. I have a tendency uh, occasionally once a year or so to be able to go to Kenya and the stark contrast between what I'm able to do because of my limitations in Kenya versus the United States um, begins to, to have one think about what it would be like to be able to do the things we do here in the United States there uh, for, for people. And especially with respect to da Vinci, when you think about remote surgery, it's really, again, about collaboration. If a, a urologist can do a, a prostatectomy in one room uh, while there are two patients and he's going from console to console, it's easy to see how that could be done very remotely and maybe just have one, someone trained to put uh, uh, the device in place on the patient. So. For me, it, it wasn't, I don't feel like that I was connected in the sense that I was visionary about these things, but they were sort of, as I began to get in these different areas within my specialty, the connections sort of started to pop up. And 
for me, I'm the wellness director uh, for the Baptist Health System and, and trying to mitigate burnout and promote professional fulfillment. And we know that uh, that's a, a huge problem in uh, uh, worldwide and physicians. And I think part of uh, what I see that is positive in this movement with uh, this technology is that it creates a lot of purpose and fulfillment and potential improvement in quality, which is one of the things that tends to, to result in the moral injury that results in burnout. And it also, I think, again, uh, improves our communication if I can collaborate uh, with someone in Brazil, Dr. Paganini, for example, or uh, in Italy or the Netherlands uh, about a patient in a, in a virtual world, real time, and be able to establish a real connection that benefits the patient, then that's going to be, I think, protective for us in terms of burnout. But it's, it's all to me about uh, the human connection within the digital worlds and virtual reality, whether it's with a patient, another physician, or a community, uh, to me, that makes it paramount. Uh, and how these all interact, um, it, it's really about having a virtual presence and being able to uh, effectively tie those uh, in a meaningful way to uh, other individuals uh, that generates the true opportunity as I see it uh, for improvement in healthcare. You know, Dr. Jones, I just, um, you know, in, in a moment, I'll, I'll have the privilege of introducing Dr. Luisa Paganini, um, but just a, a quick, quick question for you before we move on. You, you have a very clear understanding that virtual, um, has a, a real component to it. When we're talking about wellness uh, and professional wellness today, the, the ability to deal with real world challenges such as burnout and draw upon the virtual world to address the practical world is um, becoming really um, a, a massive business. I, I just returned from the Global Wellness Summit um, uh, last week, and it, that's evolved into a $4.4 trillion industry. Uh, medicine is playing a tremendous role in uh, wellness apps, virtual reality, as, as Raphael talked about, using that for uh, trauma and so forth. Um, I, at, when we get to the q and I, I will turn to you and, and ask you a little bit about what you're doing within Baptist Health and, and your own leadership vision, because obviously the metaverse plays a tremendous role in surgery, but it it, it sounds like from your words, it plays a tremendous role in keeping the surgeons healthy as well. So uh, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about your practical clinical work of using digital health technologies, you know, in the, in, in the patient care setting, but also how about the health professional care setting? So I want to thank you for your words and, uh, and thank you for your, your, your global leadership in this. We're going to turn over now to Dr. Luisa Paganini. It's a privilege to have her with us. She's a orthopedic surgeon. She specializes in orthopedic oncology, and, and she is joining us from uh, a hospital setting in San Paulo, Brazil, and, um, and really is one of the cutting edge leaders of using technology um, in her country and in the world. Dr. Paganini, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Hello, good morning. It's nice to be here. Uh, so my journey with technology and medicine started, I think, a little bit before COVID and trying to uh, get patients to do virtual consultations every now and then and uh, failing miserably because no one wanted to do that. Uh, it's been mentioned before, right? Um, well, directors and nurses and still want the old way and uh, change is always difficult. So during COVID, it got a lot better because if the patients could not physically come to you, then the hospitals and clinics just started providing more ways for us to do that. Uh, and then it's gone exponentially higher after TEMPS course, just uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, with me seeing every pathway that we could go. And um, I think technology is a great ally in healthcare, actually. 
but I think it has to come for both the patient's benefit and ours as surgeons, as doctors. Um, so we do need to have a seat at the table and to participate in a human-centered way of doing things. Because you get the softwares and um, even Da Vinci and all that are thought by engineers and, um, and so on and software engineers. And they're not the patient, so they don't know how that journey is, and they're not in our shoes. So if we can be a part of this industry and actually help make things better, I think we can make it better for, for everyone, right? And as Dr. Um, Jones was saying, with the um, burnout that we have and with information coming every other way, we can get overwhelmed with information. So I think we need to be um, stepping forward, uh, trying to reduce all of these, um, well, not useful information we get and uh, trying to have things that really help us. So a software that is effective in tracing whatever we want from the patient and uh, that can maybe connect to our computer and to our software at the hospital and get it going instead of having, I'm sure every surgeon has had this, uh, 20 pictures of the patient's uh, operating side because he thinks he thinks there's something wrong there and then he's trying to communicate that to you but then it's Saturday night and you're getting overwhelmed because you've been working all week and you do not need another photo on a Saturday night right so maybe if we have uh, an organized way of doing that where he can reach you set up a date show you what's wrong and we can combine everything that would be great uh, one of my projects now is trying to get the patient's um, journey through a surgical center a little better and trying to reduce um, turnover times and, um, uh, well, just delays in surgical operations because I think everyone gets mad at that. And I think it's something where we don't have enough data. So I've been trying to work on a software that just puts actionable data on tables so we can just do a, a little bit of work on our surgical centers for now. So that's one of my main projects right now. You have a very, uh, Crystal, thank you. You have an amazing real world view of this from the uh, patient perspective. Um, no, the the reality is what comes what comes across loud and clear in your words is um, center around the patient. Make this work for the patient. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's um, technology for the sake of improving your ability to make a connection. And I, I want to thank you and Dr. Jones and, and Dr. Grossman and Dr. Aguiar for. Um, your thoughts because you you actually created a great picture. I'm wondering if I could say to our our host if I could bring the four of you back in as a panel now and ask you um, some questions. And uh, I will be watching the chat if people have specific questions. We have we have about 15 minutes left of our session. Um, I don't know if Dr. Sinoski is is with us. Did was he able to break out of surgery? I'll ask our his slide is up, so I just want to see. Is he here? No, he he was not, Gil. Yeah, he yeah, was so, called in. So that's that's fine. And and thank you, David. And I just want to say, Dr. Grossman, um, also just at the end of his talk, he had to jump out for a trauma case. So I want to emphasize to our audience today and our listeners that our our panelists are hardworking surgeons who are using state-of-the-art technology um to um to really help people. So uh, by the way, Dr. Jones has just li listed his Twitter handle. I've listed my Twitter handle. Uh, you can follow Tamp on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of our other panelists are on Twitter, but we encourage you to follow us all. And uh, in turn, we share professional information that we think would be beneficial to you. So uh, again, um, if you're in the field and you wanna stay up to date on um, what is happening, at, in the field, you know, feel free to follow any of us 
And we welcome that. We welcome that. So let me, uh, Dr. Um, David, with your permission, let me invite our panelists, uh, panelists to uh, join me in, in some Q&A. Um, we have with us Dr. Aguiar, we have Dr. Jones and Dr. Paganini. And I, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Aguiar, and then um, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask if, um, if my other panelists will listen closely to his answer because I, I really want to tap into um, uh, to all of your thoughts. Technology is is kind of a fad, and and uh, you know Dr. Grossman kind of tried to dissect between technology that is practical in surgery and with the patient, and technology that's cool and nifty. And so, uh, Dr. Aguilar, I, I'm wondering if you could give a perspective of how you discern between um, we need to learn this, folks. Like we need to understand how augmented intelligence (AI) fits into the work. We need to understand how virtual reality fits into the work. You now we need to understand how wearables fit into the work. Um, and how do you decide? I need to learn about this. No, I don't want to learn about this. This is just like a passing fad. Can Can you give me your perspective, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, in my perspective, how can I choose the best use of this technology or another technology to improve my patient experience? I have some specific points. Um, first of all, if this technology improve, uh, reduce cost, uh, improve results, or this technology make have improve the experience of the patient or improve my experience. As a doctor, as a, as a plastic surgeon, we are always talking about patient expectative, what he's thinking about the results. And I can use some tools like uh, augmented reality. I can use some tools like um, predictions models to show some results and discuss this to, to patients, discuss with patients and show, show him, this is impossible. This that you find on your social media, it is impossible. It's a computer modeling. So I have to, I sometimes I use these tools to show the patient the reality and, and modulate, modulate the, expect, the expectations. So for me nowadays, I'm using this technology to better communicate about the results and to decide about the, the surgeries. That's my point of view. That's very appreciated, by the way. Um, and uh, Dr. Jones, you know, you're, you're in a unique field where um, there is, like, like Dr. Aguilar and, and Dr. Paganini, there's, there's a relationship with a patient. And you, you might be using a technology during a patient care setting. Do, do you introduce the technology to the patient before you deploy it? Is, do you prepare the patient or do you think the patient is, is kind of, um, you know, whatever you want, doctor, how, how do you deploy, how do you deploy this? Oh, Dr. Grossman is back after his consult. So we're, we're going to have a chance to ask him the question I asked before, but, but, but Dr. Jones, could you tell me, is there a, is there a step you take to tell the patient I'm going to be doing this? I don't think that um, I have parsed it into a, a particular step, but I think part of the conversation I have with the patient always uh, speaks about the technology and the newer that it is, uh, I think the more uh, concerted that effort is uh, about that communication. Most patients um, lag behind significantly in terms of what they expect. And so I have a lot of patients ask about, are you gonna do this procedure by laser? When it's obvious that laser is not the best way to do this particular procedure, but they think that's the latest technology. And so they want sometimes technology applied when it isn't appropriate. Um, but having said that, I, I think I always uh, communicate the utilization of technology with the patient when uh, when I'm utilizing it uh, beforehand uh, and during, it's always part of the conversation for sure. And, and just a follow-up question to that, with your, with your colleagues, you have a leadership role within Baptist Health in terms of 
application of technologies for the well-being of, of the, the system. Um, how, how do you, can you share with us sort of like you're in the room, you're in that sort of like the, the physician's room and people are asking you as someone at the leading edge of technology, mind sharing with us, us what sort of questions your colleagues ask you as a pathfinder using digital health technologies? Well, probably the most common thing that comes up is uh, with respect to my, my role as wellness director, I do do some proctoring for um, the image guidance system, the um, Inspire Implant and the DaVinci robot. But um, when it comes to even simple things like we all know that uh, there's really good data that says that uh, some sort of meditative stance uh, is protective in terms of improving resilience and mitigating against burnout. And a lot of people have uh, a resistance uh, and a lack of knowledge about how to institute that. And there are some great apps that are available uh, like Headspace and Calm and 10% Happier that really make it very easy for someone anywhere to just take a few minutes and meditate even in between uh, surgeries or uh, on the fly if they're having a, a, an emotional moment or something like that. So that has been very helpful. And then also we have virtual visits that are uh, blinded and, and protected from uh, a standpoint. There's a lot of stigmata, particularly among physicians with you know, potential board issues regarding mental health, about getting assistance uh, if they feel like they need it. And so trying to make uh, the ability to have one see a mental health professional, maybe not in their community where, you know, someone might know or hear or see you waiting in an office to be able to do that virtually. We have a program through the Kentucky Medical Association as well as through Baptist Health where we make those uh, visits available in a virtual format that is in, in at least the physician's mind much more protected in terms of uh, privacy. Uh, that I think has been very helpful. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful in listening to your words closely. I'm, I'm, this is an appeal to our host today, you know, TAMP, which is kind enough to bring us all together. I'm, I'm hopeful they will do everything possible to share this video conversation uh, online because, you know, each of you and Dr. Jones, your words of candor about um, understanding that the physician, the surgeon um, is in a high stress position and um, and there is burnout, and we have to acknowledge that, and we, we have to intervene. And you've said some key points here that I think are a message to all of your community. So I, I wanna thank you for the candor on that. I wanna swing over to Dr. Paganini. You know, um, Dr. Paganini, you, 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 you said something that really impressed. It was a different aspect of using the metaverse, which was, how, how do you help patients better navigate the system? And the, the reality is there's this complexity about, you know, do you see patients in real life? Do you see patients on telehealth? Um, I do see the data. I understand that telehealth visits in the United States have dropped about 37%, but that doesn't mean that telehealth isn't desired. It, it means that we're, we're really dealing in now a hybrid universe. It's 37% decline in the, in the height of COVID. But if we look at it as pre-COVID, pre-COVID, um, obviously it's on the rise. So if you could talk a little bit about uh, that for us, I would appreciate your counsel of how do we get people to realize it's not this or that, it's a hybrid approach. And what's your strategy for making sure that happens? Yeah, telehealth for me before COVID was non-existent. Uh, no hospitals wanted to do it. No platforms were uh, just inside Brazilian laws for, uh, well, for sensitive information, right? So it all just started with COVID. And I think it was a great thing COVID brought us. Uh, I live in the biggest city in South America. So we have about 20 million people. Uh, and if you consider just the time for the patient to get to me, sometimes it could be like an hour each way, right? Um, so what I'll try to do is uh, just give them both options between coming in personally and doing a, a telehealth. 
Uh, and of course, we'll always offer a second consultation in person if needed. Uh, so that way I can, I now can see patients from all around Brazil, sometimes via telehealth, uh, and then they can send me while well, everything's available online. So all of the uh, MRIs or CAT scans or x-rays or everything, they can send to me previously or during the consultation and I can see it. Uh, and the, the thing we lose with the telehealth is the physical examination, right? So we can try and guess and talk to the patient. I think it takes um, a couple more minutes for us to get around that. Where, how does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Can you point it to me? Uh, what movement do you make that makes that hurt or uh, click or anything? Um, and usually on first consultations, I'll ask the patient to come in whenever possible and just do a physical examination. But we do cut a lot of times because I work with oncology. So uh, a lot of times patients are really stressed about what their diagnosis may be. Absolutely. So is cancer, is it not a cancer? And we can rule that out pretty well, just talking to the patient and seeing their exams. So the patient can be a lot calmer by the end of the consultation and then schedule a day to come in. Or I can tell them, well, it's probably cancer. We should do a biopsy. When can you come in? And then they'll come in the same week or the next week and we can schedule that. Just a uh, quick, quick follow-up question for you. And then we're going to shoot over to Dr. Grossman for a final question. Um, you know, you're at the cutting edge of, of advocating for patients and, 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 and bringing sort of like using technology as a bridge that connects physicians, health professionals, and patients at the right time, at the right place, for the right situation. And, you know, you're obviously very focused on the patient. I'm just curious, in general, how much training do physicians receive during medical school or their residency in using digital health technologies like telehealth? like applications or wearables or remote patient monitoring or all of this? How many courses do you take to develop a sense of baseline knowledge? You're very knowledgeable, but how many courses um, do you have? I today, none. I mean, most of my teachers in medical school still said that we need not have a virtual presence because patients should come to you by mouth-to-mouth -mouth propaganda, right? This is, so, so we're going to jump over to Dr. Grossman. That was, that was a key thought, Dr. Paganini. I want to thank you. You know, the, the nun is the, is the scary answer and why I want to thank you and Dr. Jones, Dr. Grossman, Dr. Aguilar for joining us today because you, obviously you're learning you're, because you're committed, all of you, to patient care. I, I urge all of our participants today to follow all of your examples. So I'm going to swing over to Dr. Grossman. I hope that the the patient situation you had to jump out for, Raphael, um, is resolved successfully. Um, that, that you're not sort of saying, hey, you no, know, increase plasma volume. I'll be back in a few moments while I handle this webinar. So, Dr. Grossman, I have a quick question for you. You, you know, the, the sense of developing a vision around the metaverse for an institution. You're a visionary. Obviously, you've been reading Jules Verne since childhood. How do you impress upon your system that we you need to have a plan about how we're going to incorporate the metaverse into health? Yeah, Gil. In, you know, it's it's. I think that the, the mistake is um, is is focusing too much on the technology. You know, it, it, things are evolving and they're naturally evolving, and the way we do things today is not the way they, we did things. You know, 20 years ago, look at the laparoscopic surgery, for example. Uh, you know, it was hard to accept, and suddenly it's, it's the standard of care. So uh, there's something called Amara's law that you're probably familiar with, right? Uh, uh, every technology that is, uh, you know, uh, advanced uh, at the beginning is uh, a really, uh, a, a, everyone talks about it. It's uh, a, a, everyone is, is, is talking about the GPS back then when GPS was invented or the telephone. 
But then over time, in the long term, really we subestimate those technologies. I think that the same thing is going to happen with XR and the metaverse, uh, like telemedicine, like telehealth. Uh, all those things are going to become part of the natural flow. Just like we email patients today and we didn't, you know, 15 years ago, just like we talk to them on a smartphone and we didn't, you know, 20 years ago, eh, eh, we are going to connect with them eh, 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 in a virtual visit. And uh, it'll be us, it'll be an AI enabled avatar, and it will not be a substitution of the face to face traditional medicine that we did in the past and that we still do. It's, it's just a compliment. It's a beautiful thought. You know, I know that you're working on a, a digital clone of yourself right now so that you can do two surgeries at once. I'm I'm eager to hear how this works out. I know you'll be in Israel next week, like exploring the newest technologies there. And obviously your your digital clone will be continuing surgery in New Hampshire. So I, I'm, I'm eager to hear how that works out. I, you know, I, I just want to point out as we wrap up, um, does anybody know what this is? And you might think it's a USB key, right? Everybody will say, oh, it's a USB key or something like that. Th this is actually a, um, a Apple iPod mini micro. And obviously the thought of carrying around a boom box was replaced by putting all your music in a little device like this. We, when this was developed originally, or the, the person who developed it um, suggested it, his colleague said, why do we need this? We've got a boom box. And lo and behold, we combined it as Raphael just showed us. Everything is here now on our smartphones. Raphael, Dr. Paganini, Dr. Jones, Dr. Aguilar, I want to thank the four of you for joining us. I also want to thank Dr. Sanowski, who couldn't join us. He was in uh, surgery. We heard today some brilliant thoughts. I I'm going to listen to this webinar again just to enjoy it in a different format. We heard about the need to focus on patient care. We knew we heard the need to have some courage from Dr. Grossman, from Paganini, Dr. Paganini. She told us, start with the patient and work backward. Dr. Grossman conveyed to us, be bold, be courageous, be practical. Um, you know, understand how technology is constantly evolving and moving in this. Uh, Dr. Jones talked about the broad use of technology and the fact that Often uh, the patient, the consumer, is, is also educating themselves, coming in with an expectation that you're going to use state-of-the-art laser technology when really it's take this tablet, please, and you'll be fine. So it's a question of being prepared to answer the consumer's question and also being prepared to use technology to take care of the health professional, the community itself. And Dr. Aguiar talked about the need for education, the importance of this conversation. The four of you, I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you also to um, David Hall, the TAM team, that was incredible. I wanna thank you for bringing us together. David, in the last moments, I wanna turn it back to you to wrap us up. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Gil. You, Gil. Wonderful job. We hope that everyone was uh, truly inspired as I was, and we hope that you can Join us again uh, next month, December 8th. Uh, we'll transition into healthcare uh, singularity. Everyone has been talking about this kind of convergence of all these, these technologies and a new model, a new concept of a mega project. So we're excited. We're thrilled about that. I think that's going to be a, a great webinar, how we might as doctors play a crucial leadership role. So Thank you very much. Let's just take a, uh, we'll take a group shot here. We've got everybody uh, on. Everyone smile, say hello, say thumbs up. <laughs> so enjoy your evenings, good night, good, uh, enjoy your, the rest of your day, the rest of your afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank David. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.